Good evening. My name is Charlie Coker, and I'm the Executive Director of Asia Society Southern California. Thank you for joining our program this evening, uh, World Order in Transition. Um, the program will be moderated by our, our own very uh, Jonathan Karp. Jonathan is a journalist and the former Executive Director of Asia Society Southern California. Uh, prior to his uh, stint with us at Asia Society, uh, Jonathan was uh, a senior editor at um, Marketplace Radio on NPR, and prior to that served as a journalist and uh, staff writer for the Wall Street Journal. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to uh, Jonathan. Thank you, Charlie, and welcome to everyone. I understand we have uh, audience members from 14 or 15 different countries on several continents, so uh, thank you very much for tuning in, regardless of the time of day. Uh, we have two excellent speakers today. I'm really honored to be moderating a discussion with uh, two ambassadors, two former ambassadors, John Emerson, who is vice chairman of the Capital Group International, and Nina Hachigian, who is currently the deputy mayor of international affairs in the city of Los Angeles. Both also have had uh, domestic um, political presidential administration experience in both the Obama and the Clinton administrations. So they bring a wealth of knowledge about the domestic and foreign policy um, aspects of the, of the coming election and the near future. One quick housekeeping note, um, we welcome audience questions and we'll be incorporating them throughout the conversation today. If, you're, if you've tuned in on Zoom, there will be a little Q&A button at the bottom. Please just click that and submit your question. I think that if you're watching on Facebook, you can submit them the questions to our staff and they will forward them. So I'd love to uh, welcome our speakers and our participants, our audience, and I'd like to get started. Um, well, the title is World Order in Transition. And so I'd like to start with you, John, since we have a transition that's literally scheduled and on the calendar that's less than two weeks away, either a transition to a second Trump term or to a new administration. What are the key factors that our audience uh, should be looking for in, in this particular round? Well, first of all, Jonathan, thank you so much for uh, having me. And uh, Nina, it's so good to be uh, with you. Uh, Ambassador Hichigian, my uh, former colleague uh, from both the Clinton White House and, uh, and the State Department. Uh, and uh, we really appreciate all of you who are tuning in tonight and uh, thank you, or, or this morning or this afternoon as the case may be, depending upon where you're joining us from. So thank you very much for doing that. Uh, you know, uh, Jonathan, I, I guess three points, uh, just to, to level set, this is clearly the most um, unusual and unique presidential election, I think of all of our lifetimes, when you consider the idea of a, a global pandemic, uh, and on top of that, a global economic crisis brought about by the public policy response to that pandemic. On top of that, in our country, we have a national conversation on race and racial inequality. And then just for fun, we threw in a Supreme Court fight in the final uh, few weeks of the campaign. And, um, uh, you know, you can't turn anywhere now in the United States without seeing lots and lots of TV commercials, radio commercials. Uh, clearly, people are very energized about this election. You know, how many times have we been in campaigns in the United States when we hear, you know, there's no difference between these two candidates. They're all the same. You don't hear anybody saying that in this one. And, uh, and I think that in part is what has um, uh, created the energy uh, of the voting. Over 40 million Americans have already voted compared to 5.9 million on this date uh, in 2016 through early voting or, or sending their ballots in, in the mail. And we still got about 12 days to go till, uh, or 13 days to go till election day. So the three points I'd keep in mind are this. Number one, the polls. I mean, you can't pick up a newspaper or turn on a television without hearing about the polls. And they've actually been remarkably consistent. They show uh, Joe Biden, uh, I, I mean, going back till March when it was clear that Biden would be the nominee, typically show Joe Biden well ahead in the popular vote, uh, show him slightly ahead, uh, in uh, pretty much all of the swing states that, that we're focused on, uh, but within the margin of error. And my cautionary note there is ignore all that. Uh, as we learned in 2016 and in 2000, 
it's not the winner of the popular vote who gets to be president of the United States. It's the person who's able to cobble together enough states to get up to 270 electoral votes who wins. And just to put a pin in that, if you look at the, you take the three states that uh, in 2016, you know, Donald Trump sort of shocked the political world by winning. That was the three states in the upper uh, Midwest, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania, which since 1988 have been part of what's known as the blue wall, the, the states the Democrat always wins in presidential elections and Donald Trump won those three states. We'll put those aside. All he needs to do is win one of those three states and hold all the other states that he won in 2016. And he's elected president of the United States, even if Joe Biden beats him by 10 million votes. Uh, so bottom line is this election, I think, is a lot closer than a lot of people give it credit for being. The second uh, thing to maybe help folks, particularly those of you who are going to be watching tomorrow night's debate, which is sort of the last major consequential calendared event uh, that we have before elect, uh, the election or election day um, uh, is to think about the frame of the event. So Joe Biden wants this campaign to be a referendum on Donald Trump and how he has handled the COVID, uh, global, the COVID pandemic. And the reason for that is that the Americans don't give him very high marks for that. In fact, uh, uh, his disapproval rating is up over 60% for how he's been handling the COVID pandemic. So, so the Biden campaign and the Biden is always trying to bring it back to that conversation. And, and, and candidly, when um, the news broke uh, you know, two weeks ago that the president and the first family and much of the senior White House staff had come down with COVID-19, that wasn't good for the president in large part because it made the conversation about the campaign right back smack in the middle of the of the pandemic. The Trump campaign, on the other hand, is trying to remind people that a presidential election is not an up or down choice about an uh, individual. It's a choice between two individuals. And so they're basically running Trump as a candidate who, uh, you know, you may not like everything he does, but boy, he sure knows how to build an economy and, and talking about the record that, uh, that he had in the first, you know, three plus years of his administration until we ran into the pandemic. Uh, and by the way, this guy on the other side, Biden is quite unattractive. And it took them a while to get their footing in terms of how they were going to characterize Joe Biden, uh, in part because one thing that you pretty much find, uh, you know, unanimous agreement on is Joe Biden's a nice guy. He's a, a decent human being. Uh, he cares about people. He's empathic. Uh, and so the early attacks on him as being corrupt or and that kind of thing, th those didn't uh, really stick. So what they're now doing is running against Joe Biden by pretending that he's, by basically running against Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren and the left wing of the Democratic Party. So the narrative uh, that the Trump campaign is trying to promote is, you know, Joe Biden is a nice guy, but he's getting old. Maybe he's lost a step. And if he's president, he's going to be controlled by the left wing of the Democratic Party. And you're going to see all sorts of policies like defund the police, like, you know, um, Medicare for all, which would eliminate private health insurance, it's, uh, et cetera, uh, that you don't like. And the reality is Biden actually ran against those things in the primaries. That's how he won the primaries. But you will see in tomorrow night's debate, Donald Trump trying to put Joe Biden in the uncomfortable position of, of, of basically, uh, you know, uh, going against those ideas and risking uh, annoying or minimizing the enthusiasm of the left. And in those three minutes of the first debate that you could actually understand what they were talking about, you heard Trump a couple of times say, aha, you've just lost the left there when Biden was asserting himself against some of those positions. So that's the framing of the election. That's what you're going to see on the television tomorrow night and, and, and really through the rest of the, of the campaign. The final point I want to make is the pandemic has changed not only the way we campaign, but the way we vote. In most elections, about 25 percent of the American public votes by mail. In this election, we expect it to be over 60 to 65% of people are gonna vote by mail. And voting by mail is 
it's not necessarily complicated to do, but it's sure complicated for the election authorities, uh, which are typically local uh, um, elected and non-elected officials in every county and every state in the country. It's challenging for them to deal with. And the reason it's challenging is if you think about it, when you go and vote in person, you show your ID, your driver's license or what have you. Uh, they look at the picture, they look at your signature, they say, okay, that's you, go ahead and vote. But when you're voting by mail, you don't have that authentication process. So typically what happens is people fill out their ballot, they put it in an envelope, and then they're required to sign the outside of the envelope, often under penalty of perjury, saying, yes, I am who I say I am. Sometimes in some states, they have to even get a witness to sign it as well. And so the first step that takes place when the election authorities receive this mail-in ballot is they have to um, authenticate the ballot. And the way they do that is they compare the signature of the voter with the signature they used when they registered to vote, which might have been 10, 20, 30 years previously. Sometimes signatures change. Sometimes people ignore the restri uh, uh, miss the instructions and they print their name instead of signing it. Sometimes they sign the name in the wrong place. Sometimes they don't sign it at all. For all those reasons, it turns out that historically, almost 1% of mail-in ballots get disqualified. The problem with mail-in ballots is not fraud. There's no fraud in this process. And the, and the um, FBI has confirmed that, notwithstanding what the president keeps talking about. The problem with mail-in ballots is that this process of authenticating the signatures could well turn into the hanging chads, if you remember back to Bush v. Gore in 2000, of this particular election. And the way it can play out is if the polls, if, if the race is really close and it's either a close, you know, uh, with Trump a little bit up or Biden a little bit up after, you know, the elections or uh, the votes are counted on November 3rd, I guarantee you in a number of these swing states, you will have the, the number of vote by mail ballots that have yet to be counted or even that arrive after election day because if you drop the mail, uh, the ballot in the mail before election day and it's, and it's stamped by the uh, postal office, it still counts, uh, will overwhelm what may be a narrow margin of uh, lead that one candidate or the other ha has. And it may take days, if not weeks, to count those ballots. Then I just want to warn everybody that during that period of time, you're going to see lawsuits. You're gonna see battles over what ballots get counted, what ballots don't get counted. You will probably see protesters taking to the streets um, you know, throughout our country. And it will be a period of great uncertainty, not only in America, but I think around the world. And it'll be a period of great uncertainty in the markets as well. But the good news is at the end of the day, the courts will rule, the ballots will be counted, the elections will be certified, and we will know probably by mid-December, which is when the Electoral College has to get together, we will know who got 270 electoral votes or more, and that person will be inaugurated uh, in January, on January 20th of 2021. And at that point, when there's a restoration of certainty, I think the markets at a minimum will begin to, to come back and, and to stabilize. So uh, it's just important for people to be prepared that there may be this period of uncertainty and instability, uh, but we will get through it. Right, well, the, the way you painted it, it, it's very clear and it's it's clear to, um, sorry, it's clear to, uh, you know, I think the, the electorate and the world that in a sense, democracy is on trial here. And I guess you could also say that that connects directly to foreign policy. Um, Nina, why don't you take it from there and sort of break down the sort of the major foreign policy implications of either a Biden or a Trump win? Sure, thank you. And it's, it is uh, great to be here. Thanks for having me. It's great to be with uh, Ambassador Emerson as always, good friend, John, we've known each other for ages. And, uh, you know, uh, the mayor was an Asia Society fellow. So he's got a lot of fondness for the Asia Society as do I. Um, which I've interacted with over the years, and welcome to everybody around the world. Um, so I'll start with the Trump uh, second a victory for Trump, which is easier um, because it'll just be basically more of the same. Although, unfortunately, I predict if Trump uh, wins, that his foreign policy will be even more chaotic 
Um, there'll be actually even less policy and more danger. Um, that's because the, the experts have almost all already left the building. Um, the folks who, uh, that's not entirely true, but there are um, fewer and fewer um, professionals left um, who, who want to um, conduct foreign policy under this president. I know that there are some career uh, people who are just hanging on, waiting for the results of the election. Um, but I'm afraid that if uh, Trump wins, that you'll see another exit um, of, of really experienced people away from the State Department and the, um, and the intelligence services and, and elsewhere. Um, and that's saying a lot because we've already lost 60% um, of our career ambassadors, which is you know kind of impossible to replace those the incredible years of experience and, and the incredible judgment that those folks have. Um, opinions of the United States are already around the world at an all time low. Um, I think at this point, if our allies um, will still be willing to work with us and will want to take us back, although I don't think that process will necessarily be always smooth, but with four more years of Trump, I think we'll find ourselves very alone um, isolated and much less powerful than, than, than even we are now. So let me turn then to a Biden victory. Um, and of course I'm speaking only for myself, not for the campaign or for the LA city government. Um, so I think there are three, I've seen people slice and dice this various ways, but, but the way I understand it is that there are three main pillars to a Biden foreign policy. So number one is to get our own house in order. Um, number two is uh, a return to cooperation, including uh, with allies and multilateral organizations. And three is a support um, for democracies and upholding American values. So let me talk about each of these um, briefly. So first, getting our own house in order. Um, there are a number of dimensions to this. What is really exciting to me is that every foreign policy leader that I know are now talking about how domestic policy and foreign policy are inseparable and they should not be siloed. Um, I completely agree with this. Uh, and in fact, some right, around 12 years ago, I coined a term formestic policy, which really did not catch on. Uh, <laughs> but I, I believe it firmly. Um, and my work in the mayor's office really only confirms my belief that we've got to get our own house together and invest domestically if we're going to be able to be strong on the global stage. So what does that mean? So number one uh, is COVID. COVID has to be job one. We have got to get a handle on this uh, pandemic. And there's a lot that the federal government can do to help with that. Um, of course, it would have been easier um, in you know, January, February, March than it is now because it's now everywhere. Um, but still, there's, there is work that the federal government will need to do. Um, number two is investing again in our innovation ecosystem so that we can compete effectively. Um, that means primarily science uh, and STEM, you know, STEM education. Um, which the federal government doesn't have a lot to do with, um, and, but can do things like give scholarships um, for, for um, Americans who want to study uh, STEM in college or, or grad school, for example. And second is investing in R&D, um, in basic R&D, which has decreased sharply during the uh, Trump administration. But all the investments that we have made uh, as a federal government over the years have been the ones that have basically created Silicon Valley and all the tech giants that we have now. So we need to get back in the business of doing that, especially because um, others around the world, especially China, are investing very, very heavily. So third is infrastructure. There's a joke in Washington about infrastructure week, which is always announced and never actually happens. So I think under Joe Biden, it will actually happen. And it'll be focused not just on roads and bridges, but also on green infrastructure like solar and wind projects, um, the uh, you know shoring up of our electric grid, um, EV charging stations. That will lead to a lot of good jobs. Um, and it will also help us compete uh, globally in the green economy of the future. Um, next, I'd say be investing uh, in our workers, our people that is, you know, through healthcare, also through um, early childhood programs. Research shows that early, you know, early quality childcare can, can lead you, can, will give back to society about seven times what's invested in it, results in less crime, higher graduation rates, more career achievement. Uh, and we don't have a system um, in the United States that supports that. 
Um, we also have to repair our own democracy, um, turning all the norms that Donald Trump broke into laws, starting with the fact that candidates should have to release their tax forms um, and they should have to, the president should have to comply with congressional subpoenas. And it's a very long list of, of reforms that we will need to implement. Um, that, those will also make us stronger at home, but importantly, they will um, become an example for other democracies around the world that have, um, that have struggled that, um, you know, you can be weakened, but then you can come out of it even stronger and you can repair those, uh, the, the, you know, the fraying fabric of democracy. And finally, I'd say tackling racism, um, which is the right thing to do, of course, but also from a purely foreign policy perspective, it, um, the crisis is terrible for our reputation around the world. But also if we're gonna compete effectively and if we're gonna compete against countries like China, we need to fulfill the potential of every single person, every single worker in this country so that we cannot afford to leave any talent on the table, whether that be um, people from the black community or women or LGBTQ individuals or any other um, minority, that has to be, um, uh, and it's just gonna be an important part of getting our own house together. So the second pillar is uh, returning to cooperation. So this means uh, patching things up with our allies um, who, you know, Donald Trump has um, alienated many of them. Um, and when I was in Jakarta, it was just super clear to me that our allies were really our force multiplier on foreign policy, that, 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 that we relied on them, that we coordinated with them and they were, um, of incredible help to us and uh, in getting our agenda across, which was shared, you know, among, among everybody. So, um, so not just bilaterally, um, but also in thinking through, you know, what kind of new arrangements um, we will be needing. You know, we've, we tend to, to uh, keep our Asian allies on one side and our European allies on the other, but there may be instances which bringing them all together uh, makes a lot of sense um, around, you know, a given issue. Um, Bring, coming back to cooperation also means um, rejoining treaties um, and um, groupings. Uh, we will absolutely rejoin the Paris Accord, which um, is actually not sufficient to address climate change according to science, but it does send an important symbolic step and it's a good first step um, because climate change will be a major focus of uh, Biden's domestic and his foreign policy. Also join the WTO again, the WHO, the, the UN Human Rights Council, and likely some form of the JCPOA, the agreement with Iran to uh, stop its nuclear program. Um, finally, working in concert with democracies more, um, going back to traditional role of defending human rights, including freedom of expression, um, LGBTQ rights, uh, and others. Um, Biden has said that he'll have a summit of democracies in his first year. Um, autocracy has been really on the rise uh, of late and it's, it's in the interest of the United States and our allies to reverse this trend. Um, but of course, it goes back to repairing our own democracy first so we can be um, an example. And I'll end it there. No, thank you. And uh, there are a number of points that I think we'll, we'll delve into as we go. And, and um, yeah, there was a very interesting report from the Center uh, for American Progress, which you also uh, think tank, which you were affiliated with before, that, that echoes a lot of the, the points you made about the, um, you know, about repairing and reaching out. And I think that that's uh, something that people should read. It just came out, I think, yesterday or the day before. And so I want to pick up on, on the point about rejoining alliances um, and go, go to actually to an audience question that, that came in, how quickly can the US rejoin the Paris Accords, the W8, you know, the World Health Organization, the Iran nuclear deal and the TPP to name a few um, that, that were asked about. And uh, a, a secondary question to that is, uh, would it be possible, how likely do you think it might be that uh, a Biden administration offers Obama a one to you two year stint as Secretary of State to get all this. <laughs> um, on the second, I don't I don't think so. Only because I I don't I have a feeling President Obama doesn't doesn't want that uh, headache. And there's plenty of uh, really qualified people who I think would would like to have that that job. Um, in in terms of the first question. Uh, it really depends. I mean, there's some things that we, you know, it just takes the president saying so to, to re-enter. Um, 
uh, with other, like, you know, like the WHO, I don't think we, I don't think there's much procedural, you know, stuff that needs to happen. Um, and uh, with the WTO, I think that's the case as well. I, I don't know that we formally left, but we certainly have uh, absolutely neglected it and harmed it by not appointing, um, not allowing the appointment of judges, et cetera. So, so I think, you know, those two in Paris will be very quick. Um, others like the TPP will, will take more time because, you know, I think first they're, the, the team is really going to focus on domestic policy before turning to trade. Um, so I think it'll depend. And the JCPOA as well, probably, um, I, I don't know whether there are thoughts to try to, you know, to, to you know, whether we, whether we could join, you know, right as it is now. I mean, Iran has already started um, uh, its centrifuges back up. So, um that's going to take longer to, to, to hammer out. Um, so I guess it really just depends on, it depends on, you know, what, what uh, treaty or organization and, you know, what the rules are and what the, what the current state of affairs is, which by the way, the team won't know until they get in, right? Because they don't, they, they will get some uh, uh, briefings beforehand, but, you know, understanding the full scope of where we are with all the classified material won't happen until they, until they're there. Right. Yeah, I think that's right. I think uh, particularly JCPOA is going to take a while. If I'm Iran, uh, I'm going to use the fact that we pulled out in the first place as an excuse to try to, in effect, negotiate a better deal. And maybe the best thing we do is just get a freeze at this point, and then as we as we negotiate it, I, I think a TPP is done, uh, as it's called TPP. But I think the idea of us. Um, you know, joining with uh, our allies and sort of the former TPP group uh, and, and creating something new, uh, which should be hugely important, particularly as we start thinking about dealing with China and issues around rule of law and, uh, and all that. And, and the reason I say that is I think the politics of trade has changed dramatically in this country. And you'd have to give both Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump uh, credit for that in a, in a sense, and that they... Both of them uh, had their political success in large part uh, because they focused on the reality that there are a whole lot of people, uh, particularly in the industrial Midwest, who've been left behind by globalization, also by the technology revolution, automation, robotics, that kind of thing. That doesn't get much attention. Trade seems to be the, uh, the focal point. Uh, but I think whatever we're doing in the trade area, uh, is going to um, take maybe even be a little bit more focused on how do we better protect the American worker? How do we do a better job of ensuring level playing fields by uh, focusing on uh, tough environmental standards around the world and labor and labor rights standards around the world? So I don't see us uh, doing a complete snapback to maybe where we were uh, on trade before. One thing that's interesting though is Tony Blinken, who's a former colleague and a good friend of both of ours is uh, the, the national security advisor, I guess, uh, if you will, for uh, Vice President Biden, gave a speech to um, uh, the uh, Chamber of Commerce a couple of weeks ago where he said one of uh, President Biden's first acts would be to end the artificial trade wars with Europe. And, and I have to believe that one reason for that is um, beyond... Uh, you know, just sort of making peace with our allies and setting a new tone and that kind of thing to begin to work with them, as Nina was suggesting, to collectively bring uh, our power to bear to reform, bring reforms to the WTO that are necessary to, uh, in, in particular, increase enforcement mechanisms, the teeth that uh, those mechanisms have, uh, and, and also to um, perhaps even join in a larger kind of TPP sort of uh, arrangement down the road. Right, and, and um, on the point of making the changes, I mean, there, there is a sense, and, it's, and again, it's, even though you both served in democratic administrations, your analysis of, of America's position in the world is something that's shared widely by liberal and conservative thinkers. I mean, no one that I've read who's credible believes that on balance, America has increased its influence in the world. But on that point with trade, which is which is one thing that's very, it's complicated, but from a domestic 
point of view, it's kind of easy to communicate. It's like black and white, uh, even though the issues aren't. So in terms of returning to some of these multilateral agreements, um, you know, how hard will it be to mobilize domestic support for that, even if people disagreed with some of the way that Trump went about taking on China, they, they could at least understand at a, an elemental level that it's a quid pro quo and maybe they could benefit. So how would each of you assess the, the challenge of a Biden administration getting engagement to re-globalize in a sense? Well, I think on trade, uh, USMCA can be an example. Uh, you know, there were some pretty creative, uh, I mean, by the way, a lot of what was in the USMCA was already in TPP, uh, uh, you know, in terms of modernizing NAFTA and that kind of thing, uh, because of course the NAFTA nations were all signatories to TPP. But, um, but the idea of uh, the, the way the USMCA was able to be structured uh, to get organized labor uh, in, in uh, support of it in Congress was that was pretty uh, that was a pretty unique deal. I, when I was in the Clinton White House, I ran the you know the war room to get the Uruguay round of the gap through Congress and China most favored nation trading status in 1996. And in both of those instances, the Democratic Party base organized labor was very much against uh, those uh, efforts, which ultimately passed with bipartisan success. So I do think there is a a model and a framework for it. But I mean, I certainly don't underestimate the politics. Trade politics are always really, really hard. And, and I think after the Sanders and Trump, you know, messaging and framing of, of trade and its relationship to the American worker, uh, it'll certainly be harder uh, this time. I, I agree with that on trade. Um, uh, and I would think that you'd have to go through a similar process with Nancy Pelosi to, to put something you know, else through. However, um, two, the, the, um, there's one really surprising uh, poll that I saw, uh, which suggests that something like 70% of Americans uh, think that trade uh, is a good idea, which I have never seen a number that high. So it's some weird like, backlash against the uh, against Trump's bad trade war or something. But anyway, that's that's a remarkably high number. Um, second is the consistently fairly high number that that Americans want the United States to be engaged in the world. They want us to work cooperatively. Even when you ask people, should we work cooperatively, even if it harms our own interests, a majority say yes. Uh, so so for for things like the World Health Organization, I don't see a big pushback. <laughs> Even the World Trade Organization, I don't see a big pushback or the Human Rights Council. I mean, people like the UN. There's there's a small crowd of usually Republicans who manage to argue that that you know these these countries, you know, uh, or these uh, arrangements violate our sovereignty and you know there's going to be a global police force, etc. Um, but no one really buys that. Um, and I particularly don't buy it in a situation where you've got Russia attacking our elections and they don't seem to you know, comment about that. <laughs> um, and obviously uh, China is going to be a huge issue. I mean, it gets mentioned in the campaign, although neither side is really talking in any substantive way about policies. And just coming back, there was a lot of um, dismay with how Trump went about taking on China, but a lot of people felt, well, it's the right issue, just the wrong policies. For, and for both of you, um, what are the right policies to compete better against China on the economic front, on the soft power front? I'd say, you know, I'll, I'll start and then John, please chime in. Um, uh, a lot of what I said earlier about investing uh, in the United States, I think is absolutely key. Um, I think I think the Biden administration will have a more um, coherent and like holistic policy. You'll see more consistency in messaging uh, and tone across the administration. Um, we know that it won't be based on any personal financial uh, interests of the president. Um, but the Biden team, unlike the, the Trump uh, administration, knows that we do need to work with China uh, on some really important issues like climate and North Korea's nuclear program. So the idea of complete, you know, decoupling or a new Cold War, you know, is very limited. Uh, 
I think they will really want to keep communication lines open. I was really dismayed about the closing of the, the Houston consulate. Um, but still, there, there's going to be uh, friction, absolutely, um, because we do disagree on some key policy areas. And um, Xi Jinping, you know, unlike his predecessors, is not, you know, not tolerant of dissent. He's very hostile to Western ideas and, and ideology. Human rights, as I mentioned earlier, um, uh, will become more of an issue, especially in Xinjiang, where you know, reports of up to a million people in, in detention camps. Um, and Hong Kong's democracy movement also will get more attention. And so those will um, you know, increase the friction at the same time that we're trying to you know, work together. Um, also, China's export of coal-fired power plants, I think, will, will you know, be under scrutiny. Um, and then what, you know, the, 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 the tactic or the strategy of working together with our allies to together um, present to China um, alternatives to its current behavior, I think is what, is, is what I think the, the Biden administration will try to do when it comes to trade uh, and technology. Uh, the, the, the unilateral trade war just really hasn't worked. Um, it, has, it has not worked at all. It has, you know, China has not made any of the structural changes it needs to. It has not bought the things it's promised to buy. You know, U.S. consumers have had to pay for the tariffs. Manufacturing jobs have declined. Uh, and the trade deficit, which is what it was supposed to fix, uh, was, you know, a record high uh, in August. So I, it, it has not worked. Um, and, uh, and I think you'll see a much more of a of a multilateral approach and also, you know, using, using um, the World Trade Organization and other uh, multilateral bodies to, to address uh, issues of, of, um, of concern. I would agree with that. I just got back from three and a half weeks in Europe and spoke at a conference in Germany, which uh, actually spent about three and a half days at a conference that had most of the major German company CEOs there. And uh, and Germany right now and the EU, I would say, more generally, is struggling with the issue of um, do we ally ourselves vis-a-vis -vis China with the United States or do we sort of push the United States off and uh, just build our independent relationship with China? And there is a certainly a school of thought there. I call them the greater Switzerland crowd. I'll, I'll do respect to Switzerland. who It's like, well, hey, it's good for business. We need to do that. If you ask most German CEOs, if you had a billion dollars or a billion euros, where would you spend it? They would probably spend it in, uh, spend it in China and you begin to see that happening. The idea of our shared values being of value above and beyond the pure trade relationship is slipping away. And, and I, I think that, uh, uh, to be honest with you, a lot of uh, Europeans are looking at the, this election uh, in order to help them uh, answer, that, uh, answer that question. And from China's standpoint, you can see there's a lot of interest in um, quickly you know, building these relationships with, with Europe, so not just the EU, but individual member states, you know, divide and conquer is not a bad strategy in some cases. And uh, so I, I don't think it's necessarily a slam dunk uh, that will get Europe to work with us. One way we could start, I am a regular participant in the Munich Security Conference. And at this year's conference, which was one of the last things that happened before the COVID shutdown back in February of, um, uh, of this year, um, we had uh, Secretary Pompeo and um, Secretary Esper come to uh, Munich and they gave very robust speeches about Huawei and basically, you know, uh, you, you know, demanding that and, and there's good intelligence that would support this, that the Europeans, our allies should not engage with Huawei, uh, should not use it in building out their 5G systems or what have you. And the, the vocal response, uniform response from Europe was, okay, great, what's your alternative? And I find it inconceivable with, with uh, you know, uh, American ingenuity and the technological area and with companies like Ericsson uh, uh, and Nokia that we haven't at least developed some kind of a Western consortium uh, to uh, have a cost-effective alternative uh, in building out the 5G. So, I mean, there's a lot of opportunities there. And, and Nina, you're closer to this than I am, but my understanding is that the, 
the Biden infrastructure package would also have, in addition to things like building out broadband in, in, in the rural America, which I think is super important, would also ha have issues, uh, uh, funds in it for those kinds of, that kind of research and that kind of uh, development that I think could be really important in terms of knitting us back together uh, more quickly than might otherwise take, the, uh, take place. Yeah. And, and, and on that point, I mean, the, the, the whole Huawei um, issue uh, obviously, the Trump administration has tried to use courts and strong arm allies, but it does seem to be, as you point out, sort of a competition thing. It's a free market. We don't have, in some ways, the West doesn't have as compelling a solution. Um, sticking with Europe for a second, though, as China seeks to divide and conquer, as you said, um, Europe itself is dividing and um, at risk of being conquered in some ways. How does Brexit, which presumably will come to fruition in the next administration, whoever is president, how is that going to complicate or enhance um, American relations uh, in terms of reconnecting with Europe and building, building that block on all fronts, political and trade? Well, thanks for bringing that up because in, in so many of these conversations, people forget about the fact that we're two months and a handful of days away from a hard crash out Brexit. Uh, you know, the, it, it wasn't just that the UK left the EU in, uh, I guess it was January of this year. Uh, they left it in uh, the context of the Theresa May negotiated transition deal that kept the common market and the customs union intact until December 31st on the assumption there would be a new trade agreement negotiated. Now, they haven't made a heck of a lot of progress in that regard. And, and Boris Johnson just gave a pretty... Uh, uh, I wouldn't say incendiary, but certainly, uh, uh, you know, this side a hostile speech uh, about where the EU is and, and, and what have you. And uh, we could be in for a mess uh, after December 31st if they don't make some pretty quick progress to at least um, get us on the path to uh, a, a trade agreement. Now, that's really largely going to affect Europe and the UK. Uh, there could actually be opportunities for the United States in, in terms of that. And, and clearly, I think whether I got asked today earlier on a call, well, will the Biden administration want to negotiate a free trade agreement or a trade agreement with the UK separately? The Trump administration is working on that. The answer is absolutely. And, um, you know, people need to understand that the trade reps office that drives a lot of this is only a handful of political appointees. It's largely career professionals who you know, and these agreements often get negotiated over two or three uh, different administrations. So, uh, so I think that particularly if Brexit happens without a, an effective uh, new arrangement, uh, or if it's really choppy, uh, that could create uh, opportunities for us, uh, both in terms of uh, negotiating agreements, certainly there'll be a lot more pressure on the UK to do something uh, with us. And, uh, and perhaps with the EU as well. Uh, I don't know, Nina, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I've been wondering. Uh, it seems like since they've gone a few rounds, um, I, I, I was, you know, I was wondering about the timing uh, of, of, of a trade deal with, I mean, I don't see how we can not have one, um, but I also don't, I don't, I'm not clear on what the timing would be given all their other priorities, you know, for the first hundred days uh, you know, and beyond. and you know, that we'll still have, I mean, there's the, 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 the job before them is just overwhelmingly gargantuan because the other piece of it that, that we don't often talk about is that we don't know half of what has gone on in this administration. You know, we, we, there's scandal after scandal, but we don't know half of it. And so they're going to get in on day one and not only have this incredibly long agenda of things that they have to deliver on in the midst of a pandemic and a global, you know, and a, an economic recession. Um, and they will have to be, you know, we don't know the depth of the hole that they will be digging out of uh, on top of it all. So um, anyway, so my, so I agree with you. I just, I, I'm, I'm not clear on what the timing will be of, of, being, of really engaging on that. Although, you know, they're a really critical ally. Um, and so I certainly imagine that, you know, there'll be there'll be early conversations with, uh, you know, with, um, amongst the presidents and prime minister. And, and, and switching back to the sort of the, the human rights 
aspect of what you were talking about in, in, in terms of a Biden policy. Um, obviously, there's been a lot of criticism of President Trump for uh, sidling up to authoritarian governments, being very inconsistent in his messaging, except on that, on that point, actually. And so one of our audience members asks, how will upholding American values and democracy affect our relations with China and other countries like Saudi Arabia and Turkey in a, in a Biden administration? And what is the balance between pragmatism and principle? I mean, that's, you know, that's the big question, always in foreign policy. It's our values versus our interests. And it's a it's an age old question that is never uh, satisfactorily answered. Um, but I think I feel like I can answer on Saudi Arabia and Turkey more easily because I know less about them. Uh, I do see uh, I see a uh, an interest in reevaluating our relationships with both those countries um, and really you know, uh, given the fact that we are, you know, uh, a major uh, producer of energy ourselves now, um, and uh, and given you know the 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 war in Yemen and NBS being you know a reformer on some levels, but just such an unsavory uh, character on others, and then Turkey, you know, really. I mean, I'm I'm Armenian American, so I know exquisitely what they're doing. Um, uh, with helping Azerbaijan in that conflict, which they've never done before, but they're also mucking around in Syria. And so they're really throwing their weight around in, in, in a way that is not, um, does not uh, really further NATO's interests. So um, even without the human rights concerns, I think there are, there are strategic reasons to really, to rethink those relationships um, to some degree at least. And on China, I think I think we're going to be hearing a lot about the Uyghurs, you know, and and the dissidents, and um, and the you know kidnapping of people, uh, you know, and the and the holding of people of, of uh, you know the taking off the streets of, of business people and all that. Um, and you know, we it's it's a it's a concern that many of our allies share. Um, it is probably going to be up to the United States as usual to be the you know, to be the bad guy and be the one to, you know, have to, to really talk very seriously with China about that. Rejoining the Human Rights Council will be helpful because even though there are major flaws with that institution, um, it is a place where, where countries of human rights records are evaluated in, you know, in a formal setting. Um, uh, I mean, the one that, the, well, the one that really uh, worries me and the one that I don't have an answer to is Taiwan um, because that, you know, that democracy uh, is really important to the United States. Um, and yet we have a one China policy and we certainly want to avoid uh, any military conflict. But, you know, there have been reports recently about mobilizations in China. So that's the one that, I, that, uh, that keeps me up. John, does that also keep you up? Is there, do you see in, you know, during a uh, Trump administration, um, a greater tendency, a greater uh, inching toward a potential conflagration by accident, not by design in in the South China Seas? Or well, I, I think um, in general, uh, one thing we know about Donald Trump, he does not uh, want to get into more military uh, confrontations. I mean, that's not his style. The concern is Look, we have levels of communication at the high level of China, but when you talk to folks who have been involved in the past, they say that the levels of communication going down through the government at various aspects of the working level just don't exist anymore. And, uh, and there, it, there's always, we've always had through NATO and with the NATO-Russia Council, deconfliction mill to mill, military to military relationships. Hey, we're going to do a... Uh, uh, we're going to do some exercises over here. This is exactly what we're doing when we're doing it, so on and so forth. So they don't see something that we might be doing uh, as potentially, um, you know, preparing for an attack, right? And they don't respond in that way. I honestly don't know if that's going on with China, or at least if it's going on with China at the level that it should be. And, um, and so that is of concern. On that, I mean, I've read these stories about Taiwan and the building up of... Um, of troops, I can't imagine that it's in China's interest to invade Taiwan. Uh, I, I, I mean, first of all, just think of the economic consequences to China of that. 
there would be a global revulsion. You would have sanctions, uh, uh, literally, um, you know, certainly from uh, most of the Western world as a result of that. You would sure, for sure, have a very adverse reaction from Japan and uh, and South Korea, uh, from Europe, United States, what have you. It would hurt China very badly economically. And does China really want to be an occupying force uh, on on uh, on Thailand, Taiwan? I, I find that hard to believe as well. Uh, so I don't really know what's going on there. I certainly don't have any uh, readout and uh, information in terms of what is in fact going on. Uh, but it just strikes me as um, these stories that would China take advantage of uncertainty in the American process if we have a long period of time where it's unclear who the next president is by invading Taiwan? I honestly just don't see how that's in China's interest. I mean, I think as, as a lot of people have described, China's strategic strategy, global strategy is primarily economic. And that's been the biggest change, let's say in the, in the world order in recent years. And so one of our audience members is asking um, whether you think uh, the Chinese economy, given the pandemic and what it's done to the US economy, um, and given the fact that China is rebounding already, at what point will, I mean, will China surpass the US as the largest economy in the coming year? And what, if any, particular impact would that have on a US administration's policy? Well, certainly not in the coming year. I mean, uh, over time, who knows? I mean, just you know, the, uh, the the economic story of China is pretty remarkable. And, and you look at the population, you look at their growing consumer class. Uh, you know, what's interesting about China is it increasingly will become a nation less dependent upon supply chains from multinational companies and more, uh, you know, building its own, kind of like we did, you know, building its economy on the basis of the consumer needs of its citizens. Uh, you know, so that's something that could, you know, develop over over time. Who knows what happens with AI twenty uh, five? Uh, you know, and and what we're able to do in terms of um, uh, in in terms of uh, artificial intelligence ourselves, in terms of basic uh, basic research and advancement. There, I think one thing, uh, Nina, you were talking about. You know, some of these multilateral institutions. I think something we need is. Uh, uh, is is a global look at uh, artificial intelligence. What are the ethical rules? What are we, how are we going to govern that? How are we going to monitor that uh, development? Because uh, you know you, you don't have to watch too many uh, science fiction movies or read too many science fiction books to see that we're you know we're getting close to you know some of these things like Minority Report or what have you, and uh, and and we need to address that uh, pretty quickly as well. So. I mean, sure, China is growing, uh, but but I, I I think we're a, a a long way away from the point where we say, uh, well, they've now surpassed the United States economically. I'm not an economist, by the way, so let's just put that out there. You have a lot of uh, geopolitical economic strategists working around you, so uh, um, anyway, no, but but thanks. Um, actually. I want to go to an audience question that will take us back to the Middle East, um, given that we talked about the periphery country, peripheral countries of the Arab-Israel conflict. Um, Nina, how would you anticipate uh, the Biden, a Biden administration would approach that conflict, um, given that Trump has worked to, to avoid that issue and to bring in other Arab countries with Iran in mind? Would Biden reemphasize the uh, Palestinian issue? Uh, I think to some degree, yeah. I, I think I think you would you'd find I would hope kind of a more strategic approach. I mean, I am no expert in this area. John should certainly chime in, but it strikes me that there have just been a series of actions that haven't um, that haven't really addressed the core problem. Um, uh, and so, yeah, it's it's good to have you know Israel and and the UAE normalize relations and Bahrain and maybe Sudan. Like that's all good. You know, um, and then you know, moving the capital, whatever. But none of that is is has addressed the central challenge, and so we haven't used any of that as leverage to address the central challenge. So um, I assume uh, that that the Biden team would would once again try to figure out how you get a two state solution, um, and um, you know where where the like, how you arrange the the rest of the periphery to make that. Uh, that focus. 
Yeah, I, that's my sense as well. I mean, the central challenge being how can Israel, uh, given demographic realities, maintain itself as both a democracy and a Jewish state? Uh, at some point, you have to go to a two-state solution uh, in, in terms of dealing with that. So I, I don't see the Biden administration all of a sudden saying, okay, the embassy's back in Tel Aviv or, or something along those lines. Um, I've been working presidential politics a long time. I think every candidate I've worked for has pledged to move the embassy. Uh, but again, as Nina suggested, you know, as part of a comprehensive uh, deal that would move us closer to the two state, uh, the two state solution. But uh, as Nina, this is not my area of expertise either. Okay, well, I'm, I wanna end on a question for, uh, for each of you. I mean, one of the most powerful misinformation and disinformation has been around as long as diplomacy has been around. Um, but of course there are many more powerful tools for that, which makes the job of of any any foreign policy harder. So you have both served as ambassadors. How would you confront the greater challenges now of articulating American policy while probably having to unwind a lot of misconceptions uh, that complicate your job? Is that, uh, well, anyway, I just want your thoughts on the whole misinformation uh, uh, issue and how it would complicate creating a coherent I think we need to communicate foreign policy entirely in TikTok dancing. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> if, TikTok is, if TikTok is still uh, available. Um, no, I don't, you know, I think it's a, it's a serious, serious challenge. Um, so I think it needs to be a combination of telling the state actors who are involved that we're not going to tolerate it um, and doing that in a forceful way. Um, and then, you know, just trying to do our best to communicate in um, probably crisper, funnier, more interesting ways than, than diplomats tend to do. I would encourage everybody, I, I watched this documentary last night that my kids suggested I watch called Social Dilemma. Uh, on so Netflix. good. And, and I would encourage everybody to look at this. I mean, the, the whole way social media is, can be so skillfully exploited. And this is really, you know, what the Russians are doing. I mean, in, 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 in some places it was cyber attacks and all that. In our country, it's much more that kind of thing uh, of, of just dividing people and, and putting them, you know, confronting them with one another. Uh, and, and, and encouraging or, or fostering confrontations over made up stuff uh, is, uh, it, it just, that has to stop. And, uh, and I think one thing, regardless of whether it's a, a Trump administration or a Biden administration, you can see the United States Congress take a very hard look uh, at uh, some of the social media firms in terms of, uh, of, of how do we get a better handle on, on regulating this? Because the, and the tendency, the thing about social dilemma it just talks about how these algorithms have a tendency to put people more and more and more in their own silos. And the more you check something you like, that's the only information you get. And so that's why you can have these Thanksgiving uh, dinner conversations around tables in America where people literally do uh, proceed from a completely different set of facts uh, because they aren't even getting the other point of view. And, and I think that's, um, uh, that's something that really has to be addressed at a fundamental level. I mean, the QAnon is something that we talk about in the mainstream media now is just a, a real sign of, of the perfect, terrible problem. That perfect we have. example of that. And, and, you know, to that end, there was a CNN just had about a 10 minute piece on it. I, I, two days ago, I was, I, I couldn't believe it. In Los Angeles, a protest, they had people that, you know, didn't look like they were from the bar scene from Star Wars. I mean, they're just like normal folks who are out there uh, just absolute. Oh, don't you know that pizza is a code word for child pornography? Well, of course, Joe Biden is a pedophile. I mean, it's just, it's just unbelievable, uh, you know, where where this is headed. And that is 100 percent been driven by uh, what we've seen on social media. They finally are shutting it down, but you know, maybe a day late and a dollar short on that one. Yeah, it kind of invokes the word, word re-education, which doesn't seem appropriate for the US, but it, it is uh, getting out of hand. Anyway, I'm sorry that we have to stop it there. It's been fascinating. And I wanna thank you both. Uh, um, Your Excellencies, Ambassador John Emerson, who served as Ambassador 
to Germany and Ambassador Nina Hachigian, who served as ambassador to ASEAN. And depending on the outcome of the election, perhaps you will be back on the road. Um, anyway, thank you both. And uh, thank you to our audience around the world. I'm gonna hand it back now to Charlie Coker. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jonathan. And thanks to again to Ambassador Sachigian and Emerson for an amazingly interesting and insightful discussion. Um, we'd like to thank our promotional partners again um, for their support in, in, uh, for this evening's program. We'd also like to um, make a, uh, an appeal for people to become members um, and to make donations. Um, these programs are all uh, provided for free um, and uh, we would generally appreciate your support. Uh, we'd also like to note that um, uh, Asia Society of Southern California will be um, putting on its annual um, uh, and US Asia Entertainment Summit the week of November 16th through the 20th. So please mark that in your calendars and additional information will be coming to you shortly. So thanks again to everyone and uh, have a great evening. Good night.